Hey guys, welcome back to Ferrigno Freedom Channel. I'm Dante Ferrigno and I have been doing a carnivore diet known as the Lion Diet now for three years and two months. Lion Diet is a little different than your standard carnivore diet. Carnivore diet kind of allows for any meat from any animal and Lion Diet allows for only meat from ruminant animals. For those of you who don't know what a ruminant animal is, I suggest you use Google because it's a lot easier than having me explain it every single time. But let's just be clear, beef from cows is the most common ruminant animal that I eat. And I've been doing that now, like I say, for over three years. And it has done wonders for my body physically, for my mental attitude. It's even had an effect on my spiritual life. And I go into a lot of that in other videos. But today I wanted to take a look at something that I get a lot of questions about. Is it okay to just jump right in and start eating the lion diet? Is it okay to just jump right into carnivore diet from the standard American diet? I have my own perspective on that and other people have given their perspectives. But I wanted to take a look at this video saw, uh, that I saw by Dr. Bart K. Is it best to start a carnivore and lion diet with just beef and salt? This kind of gets to the root of what people are asking. Should I dive right into this? Or at least it seems like it is based on the title. So I figured I would give it a look with you guys and I'll give you my thoughts on it based on my experience as well. Let's take a look. So, um, with a good bit of my clients, a um, few of my family members, even Scott, there's a lot of people that have struggled with certain issues popping up, like underlying conditions popping up when they start carnivore, right? And mm -hmm. we feel like there's a... Um, there's a lot of people out there that are saying, oh, all you've got to do is cut everything out and eat meat and you're just magically going to get better. Like it's going to work for everyone. So I mm -hmm. wanted to get your opinion on that. First of all, are there people that need to be wary of starting the carnivore diet? That's number one. Oh, and yeah. number two, do you have a certain progression that you use? If somebody you feel like, say they've got a major oxalate problem or they've got, you know, any kind of other major issues, major health concerns, yeah. do you yeah. have like a phase program that you work somebody into the carnivore? Awesome. Okay. Yes. Great question. Okay. One of the biggest sources, I should probably not say this so much because it might cost me some business, but one of the biggest sources of clients I have are people who have been carnivore for three to six, sometimes nine or even 12 months who suddenly run into problems. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the wheels fall off and it goes all tits up for them. And they can't understand why, because they've been doing it perfectly. They've been eating nothing but beef and water and, you know, whatever else and blah, 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 blah. And, they, you know, they did everything according to what we say you should eat and not eat and la, la, la. And so why is this happening? This is not fair and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I say to them, well, okay, when you first went carnivore, let me guess, you decided to go carnivore one day and you hammered over that night, the next morning you were a carnivore, right? And you dropped out all the plants and all the carbohydrates overnight, didn't you? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, that's what you did wrong. Can't quite understand everything he's saying, so I'm turning on the captions here. And then... I say to them, well, okay, when you first went carnivore, let me guess, you decided to go carnivore one day and you hammered over that night, the next morning you were a carnivore, right? And you dropped out all the plants and all the carbohydrates overnight, didn't you? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, that's what you did wrong. That's the first thing, okay? Don't change your diet to 100% carnivore overnight. That is one of the dumbest things you can do. Here's why. You have a whole um population a whole um society if you like of microbiota of various different kinds different species different phyla they're all together with you in your guts in balance with each other in harmony for most of the time and when you're in health anyway and they all get along and they all share resources and everyone's happy and nobody's causing a problem and it's all good and then you suddenly change the available resources. You say, right, no more sugar, no more carbs, no more fiber for you guys. And the ones that have been living happily on the carbs, the sugar and the fiber suddenly go, hang on a minute, where's our resources? And so they will start warring with each other for what resources there are. 
They'll start eating through your mucosal lining of your guts. They'll start eating into your gut linings. They'll start causing inflammation, leaky gut. And that can set off a whole bunch of really serious health problems systemically. <clears throat> and it can take three, six, nine months to occur. And it, that's about the stage where the shit hits the fan. It all goes wrong. And the carnivore diet's not for me. No, no, I tried that for six months and then and it was fine. And then it all went tits up. Yeah, because you didn't do a proper transition. So what I suggest to people is whatever plant material you're eating now, you want to halve it every week for six weeks, in effect. Half what's remaining. So in other words, 100% this week, 50% next week, 25% the week after that, 12 and a week, half the week after that, 6.25, and then basically 3% and just drop it out. So you're eating like one spinach leaf at the end? Well, perhaps, you know, I guess for point you go, no, okay, fine, we're, we're out of here, we've, we've finished with the carbs now, there's, there's no carbs to speak of, right, now we're a carnivore. What I'm saying is take a number of weeks to achieve that. Don't do it overnight under any circumstances. Do not do that, no matter who you are. Um, you might get away with it, but odds are you will not many, get away with it. people don't. Yeah. No. So then, okay, yeah. so what if you have somebody who is, down in that hole and they they can't seem to find themselves out of it. How do you go mm -hmm. backwards once you've already gone hundred percent for X amount of time? Right. So All there's... right, before we get into what he's got to say about that, I guess I beat the odds on that one because I did go straight carnivore. Now I do think there are some caveats to how I started as to how some other people might be starting. If you're coming into this way of eating eating pizza and drinking beer and drinking sodas and eating candy and sugar stuff and cakes and pies and all that stuff on a regular basis, you might have a bit of a transition difficulty that I didn't experience because I was already trying to watch what I ate. I still did occasionally indulge in the treats that I, things that I, I don't consider treats anymore, but things back then that I considered treats occasionally. And by occasionally, I meant once every few days, far more than I would have now, which is hardly ever, hardly ever do I have any of those things. And really, I would just as soon never have them because I don't consider them treats anymore. But I also had already quit soda a long time ago. I was down to drinking the sparkling waters with like lemon juice or lime juice or some other juice in it, the ones by LaCroix that are, you know, you can find easily at Sam's Club or Costco or something like that. I think Bubbly makes some now as well. They don't have added sweeteners. They're just a light hint of flavor. But I've even gotten to where when I drink that, I've had those in the past recently where I taste them and I'm like, oh, that's, I don't like that flavor. I don't like that in my water. I just want clean, crisp club soda or water or mineral water maybe with some of my salt added, uh, I use Sole water, which if you don't know what Sole water is, S-O-L-E water, you can look up my other video on Sole water and you can see how I made that. I don't use as much as I used to when I made that first video. I use about half as much and I use it about half as often as well. So that's, you know, it's just something that changes over time. But I would rather just have nice, clean, crisp water. I don't need flavoring in my drink anymore. But going back to when I started, those were the things that I needed. And even then, that, that wasn't enough. I was drinking things like the Bai Coconut Waters, B-A-I Coconut Water, which says that it's infused with antioxidants and all kind of great things and that they use Stevia instead of Splenda or some other. Uh, all those artificial sweeteners, as far as I'm concerned, are not necessary and something that I don't want in my body anyway regardless of what some people may think of it. And also, I am not here to say that you don't need to have sweeteners. I'm just telling you that at some point you get, to, at some point in this diet, you may get to the point where I got to, which is, I just don't need it. I don't need that stuff in my life. I don't need sweet flavors like I used to. I used to need them because it was part of my addiction. And now I would rather just eat meat, drink water and be happy. But again, when I started, I wasn't eating 
all of that stuff on a high octane regular basis. I was eating what you would call three square meals a day. I was the administrator at a retirement home and the chef we had that worked in our kitchen would make meals that were healthy for elderly adults. And I would often eat one of those meals a day. I would have breakfast when I left the house. Now, sometimes that breakfast included a lot of bread that it doesn't include anymore. Uh, I didn't eat a whole lot of cereal. I would make occasionally eggs and bacon, but I would also eat it with toast or a croissant or something like that. Sometimes I would have cereal with whole milk, which I used to, th- I, I had learned that skim milk was just plain sugar with no cream, no value to the milk. So I was having whole milk and now I've come to realize that I don't do good with dairy at all. So, I mean, a lot of things I've learned since then, but I was basically trying to eat what I thought was healthy. And I wasn't piling down the greens like a lot of people do. I wasn't making smoothies every day and and eating those. So I wasn't getting a tremendous amount of oxalates in my diet. So I didn't have to worry about oxalate dumping. I didn't have to worry about a lot of the problems breaking the addictions that I had already broken down by this point. The problem is, is that I already had leaky gut when I started this diet. It was the reason I started this diet. So when I decided to go full carnivore, when I decided to do the lion diet, I just jumped right in and cut out the remainder of the things that I had already cut out. I didn't really think about it back then. I just thought I'm going from eating normal to eating this way. And I've talked about it a lot on my channel that I just kind of went cold turkey with it. And for some people, that's the only way they know how to do this, how to make this transition. Like if you'd have told me back then that I'd have to do a little here and a little there for six weeks, I might not have had the discipline to do that. So I don't know if you're going to really have any problems down the road. He says that the odds are that you will. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and recommend to any of you who are wanting to start this for the first time, take a look at cutting the carbohydrates out of your life at a slow rate so that you don't hurt yourself in some way. But my experience has been that I had already been doing that, so maybe it was okay for me to jump right in the way I did. I have had a few people on my channel who have been longtime followers who have told me that they finally started doing the carnivore diet. They've been watching me for over a year, but hadn't pulled the trigger. And when they finally pulled the trigger after a few weeks or a few even a few months, they'd noticed they hadn't lost very much weight. And it may be something about their body that takes time to make that transition. I'm not sure what it is. All I know is when you realize that you've got a major health problem. See, I don't know what brought Dr. K or any of these other two people to the lion diet. I'm not even sure they're both carnivores. But anyway, my point was many of us come to this way of eating for different reasons. Probably the majority of the reason has to do with wanting to lose weight. But a lot of times when weight loss is the focus, that's what keeps you from progressing because you can see things that distract you from your goal. Like if you're checking your weight on the scale every day, you can think that, oh, well, I went up two pounds today. I'm going to just have a splurge day today because it's already not working. And that's a lie. You're being lied to by your scale. It's telling you things that are in your body that don't have anything to do with fat loss. Sometimes you've got muscle gain, you've got water weight, you've got food in your body, you've got digested food in your colon that you didn't have one day as opposed to when you weighed yourself the next day. Don't weigh yourself all the time if you're going to do this because it's going to really derail you in your thinking and make it easy for you to want to quit. The question is, is why are you doing this diet to begin with? Do you have issues that you want to heal? If you're doing the lion diet, you should have some kind of autoimmune disorder or some kind of gut problem or some other issue that you haven't been able to get any resolution on from doctors that something like the lion diet has had very good luck with helping with. Now, even the founder of lion diet, the person who came up with the notion of a term and called it lion diet, Michaela Peterson, said that she went over a period of months and years of cutting out foods that were in her diet before she finally got to this stage. So even she couldn't have told you up front, no, you can't dive right into this because she didn't happen to dive right into it. I did happen to dive right into it and it changed everything for me and I haven't noticed any negative drawbacks. But I don't want to encourage everyone to do exactly what I did because maybe you won't be so lucky. I mean, he may have a lot more experience with people who have had this problem. So I certainly don't want to encourage anyone to jump into something that's going to hurt them in the long run. But I do know 
that if you realize you've got a problem, you've got to start somewhere. And if it is a six week plan that you can do or a four week plan or something to make that transition to where you'll stick with it, that's going to be the key. Because once you get that stuff out of your system, once you start to get to where your body doesn't need that stuff anymore, it is going to get a lot easier. So what if you have somebody who is down in that hole and they they can't seem to find themselves out of it? How do you go mm -hmm. backwards once you've already gone 100% for X amount of time? Right. So there's a couple of approaches depending on how severe the situation is. Sometimes we need to add some material back in that would otherwise be undesirable of a plant like nature in order to give a bit of uh, relief from the immediate symptomology if it's really bad and then ramp it back out mm -hmm. over an even longer period than we would have done the first time around do it even more slowly than that that's one approach if the symptomology is mm, but not absolutely you know earth shattering i can't go to work i can't do anything then we can go straight to actual fasting as an approach to reset everything. So we might do a 24-hour fast, have a refeed day, another 24-hour fast, two refeed days, a 48-hour fast, three refeed days, a 72-hour fast, and then three refeed days. If there's still a problem, we do another 72-hour fast and then another until we get it right. Um, usually by the time you've done two 72s, you've, you've 99 percent of clients are, are right by that stage, and they're right, right, thank you very much. Um, and, and then I send them to bed. That's they right, continue on carnivore and then just cycle. Yeah, yeah. The only time we go back to adding plants back in is if we've got a severe yeah. problem, yeah, like someone who is literally falling to bits and you know. Oops, okay, we need to give these guys something to work with and then phase yep. them out more slowly. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of vagaries in this video. I've never watched Dr. Bart K before. I've heard other people recommend him, so I wanted to check out this video. The one thing I'm seeing that I, I don't agree with is jumping into fasting being an okay solution if jumping into carnivore is not an okay solution, how can getting rid of most of the bad stuff in your life be worse than getting rid of all of the stuff in your life, all of the food that you eat? That doesn't make any sense to me. Even though it's over for short periods of time, I, I don't quite see that connection there that that's going to make it better for you. Also, he doesn't mention exactly what the problem is. Now, he talks about people not being able to get up and go to work. The number one reason I see people having problems like that when they start lion diet or a carnivore diet is because they're not getting enough electrolytes. Their bodies are used to getting energy from the sugar that they consume, from the carbohydrates that they consume. And when you cut those things out, you've got to increase the amount of electrolytes that you're getting because electrolytes can help power your body a whole lot better than carbohydrates can. Your body also can make all the carbohydrates you need right in its own liver when it converts uh, protein into glucose. So you're not running without glucose altogether, but if your body hasn't adapted to the fact that you're not consuming glucose for turning into fuel, then you're going to need something else to give you some energy. That was the key for me was finding out that sodium was an electrolyte. When I first started this way of eating, I didn't know sodium was an electrolyte. I didn't even know what an electrolyte was. I was like the people on that movie in Idi Idiocracy that would talk about Brondo. It has electrolytes. Nobody knew what electrolytes were or how they worked or anything like that. I was one of those people. I didn't know that electrolytes included calcium, chloride, magnesium, potassium. I think I knew me magnesium and potassium were, but I didn't know that sodium and chloride and calcium were also electrolytes. I didn't know that electrolytes were metal-based objects either. It kind of blew my mind to find out that they are metallic objects. They're not rocks or something like that, even though they come from salt. Sodium and chloride both are what make up salt, and they're electrolytes. So when I found out about that through Michaela Peterson, I realized what I was missing that one time that I wasn't powering down vitamins when I was doing the Atkins diet back in 2006 and I missed like four days of having any vitamins. All of a sudden I had this huge crash. I was using the vitamins to give me some sort of energy source that I wasn't getting from not having enough electrolytes. 
And ever since I added electrolytes, I haven't taken any vitamins since I started this way of eating. The only type of supplements I even have at all are iodine. I do take some vitamin D, which isn't technically a vitamin anyway. It's like a type of hormone of some kind. And it's produced in your skin when sunlight hits it. So, I mean, something that gets less with age, although I try to get more suns because I'd like to get my vitamin D naturally. But those are the two supplements that I take. But whenever I've had somebody come to me and ask, why do I feel so lethargic? Why do I feel so tired? I usually tell them, try upping your salt intake. Are you having salt with your water? I had one ounce of Soleil water added to this bottle before I, I put my club soda in there. That's how I get my electrolytes. I put salt on all of my steaks. I use smoke salt sometimes too. When I buy the carnivore bars over here, I get the salted carnivore bars because they have a little bit of salt in them. And I'm not using table salt, by the way. I want to get good, healthy, natural, real salt. I personally like Redmond Real Salt. And I talk about them in the description of this video. And you can also buy their products and use my discount code to get them. But one of the reasons I like Redmond salt is it comes from an ancient seabed. It's not going to be contaminated with modern day pollutants that are going to be in seawater. And it's also a, an American made product. So me being an American, I like to support American companies. And I like Redmond in general. I also use one of their electrolyte mixes in my drinks. I use Relight. I only use the unflavored version because I don't want any citric acid in, my, in, in anything I drink or eat. Because citric acid is manufactured and it comes from a type of mold called Aspergillus niger and it causes inflammation in your body. And I'm trying to avoid those things. So even with the products that I recommend, I'm selective about which products I use because I want to make sure I'm getting good, healthy electrolytes, good, natural sea salt. The bottom line is, is if the, if the one example he's using is people are feeling lethargic or unable to go to work, that's usually an electrolyte problem. That's not a problem from not having vegetables. Now, what I have heard that you might have to bring back into your diet is if you were having a heavy green-based diet, if you were drinking a lot of smoothies before you came to the carnivore way of eating, you were probably shoving oxalates into your body at a very high rate. And those oxalates build up in your body and then when they start to come out because you're not eating them anymore, it's a, something called oxalate dumping occurs. Now, this is something that I've had a hard time putting my fingers on, but I also understand a lot of people have experienced it. So I'm not here to say that it's true or not true. I'm just saying that what I've heard from experts who talk about it, like Sally K. Norton, that talk about if you're experiencing oxalate dumping, you may even be able to see it in little things popping out of your skin, little dark spots that are coming out look like blackheads, but they're not blackheads. It's oxalates. It's the same thing that gets caught in your kidneys that causes kidney stones. Well, when you start dumping them out of your body, you may get some experience with them coming out of your skin. I've even heard that they come out of your eyelids. I never had anything like that. But one of the things she recommends if you do experience oxalate dumping is to, to engage in a little bit of oxalate rich food, like having a little bit of spinach for a few weeks and ramping that down as you go because what you're experiencing is something where if it had enough oxalates to keep you from dumping the ones that you have, it could slowly come out of your system in a more natural way. That's the best thing I can say about that. But it seems like he's being very general and vague about this and I just don't know what to think about it. I know that some of you may have a great opinion of Dr. K and this is the first video I've ever watched of him. But I didn't have any of that experience. But I do think it does make a difference the way you were eating before you came to this way of eating. The, the more extreme the change, the more likely you are to have some symptoms that are going to cause some problems. So I'm not against the idea of taking it slow, getting into a carnivore way of eating. But I do see the benefit in fasting occasionally. And getting up to a 72-hour fast it was one of the best things I ever did. It took me about a year and a half into this way of eating to be able to do that. It was almost, yeah, it was right at a year and a half that I had my first four-day fast. And uh, it was something. But I didn't do it again for a long time after that. About a year later, I finally decided, almost a year later, I decided I was going to start doing some rolling 72-hour fast where I was doing 72 hours of fasting and uh, 96 hours of eating. And I did that for an eight-week period. I didn't find any tremendous breakthroughs in that. I didn't feel like it changed my life or I lost a whole lot of extra weight or saw loose skin go away. 
it was just something that I enjoyed doing because I knew that my body was getting into ketosis and that in general that should be better for your cellular process. It's going to help with fighting insulin resistance. But it wasn't like it was some kind of miracle or some change that nothing has compared to what has happened to my body when I stopped eating all that junk and went to a full lion diet. And that's just my honest opinion on it. My yeah. sister who ended up um, dumping kidney stones out of both kidneys. Let me, let me back this who up. Who is literally second. falling to bits and, you know, props. Okay, we need to give these guys something to work with and then phase yeah. them out more slowly. Like my yeah. sister who ended up um, dumping kidney stones out of both kidneys had to have four Ooh. surgeries and, uh, it, yeah. it was, and her throat started closing up because her histamine went through the roof. It was a, it was yeah. a dangerous situation. And Scott and I have talked before about how most people out there talking about carnivore are like, oh, it's all roses and everybody should try it. But the reality is it can be very dangerous if it's not yes. done properly, if it's not transitioned to properly. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a lot, it, yeah. there's a lot more potential for, for danger than people realize. Yeah. Yeah. You did it wrong and you never really were a carnivore. Mm -hmm. That's what we said. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know. That seems like an extreme way to put it, that it can be really, really dangerous. But I mean, people have different experiences than I've had, so so it is possible. I, I just, I don't, I don't know what to think about that. One, I feel like I'm, you know, I, I, I don't feel like they're attacking me directly because for me, it has been <laughs> mostly roses. Uh, there have been times, especially here in my third year, I've noticed a bit in the past couple of months that I'm a bit more tired than I used to be. And I feel a little bit more, I feel like it's been more difficult to get up and do my exercise, but that could be just a phase caused by something else. I have no way to know exactly what's doing that. I'm not having any oxalate dumping. I don't know that I have all the answers on all of this, but I do know that even though I went basically from a regular way of eating to a straight lion diet, I do know that and everything has been better in my life since then. Even now when I'm struggling a little bit, it's not nearly as bad as it was before where I had constipation every morning and I just didn't want to get out of bed at all. I wouldn't want to go to work. I would actually miss work because I was feeling so bad. I would get so angry at everything. Uh, just the tiniest thing would set me off. I don't have that anymore. I mean, if I could go back and decide to go into this slowly and reducing a little bit at a time, I personally wouldn't do that. I'm very happy with all the results and everything that's happened in the past 38 months that I've been doing this. But that's just my experience. You know, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys the best I can because of my experience. I'm not one of the doctors out there. I'm certainly not a nutritionist. I'm just trying to help people understand that lion diet changed my life. And it's gotten nothing but better over the years. I feel better now at 51 years old than I did was when I was in my teens. I'm out sprinting on a regular basis now. I didn't even think I would be able to run in my life, let alone sprint at top speed for short bursts and feel like that that is something that I want to do. But every time I do it, I feel even better than I would than I did before I started. I, many a time I'm getting out there to go sprint and I think my body's a little bit tired because I started a new job and I'm working late at night and I'm getting up later than I used to. And I'm also doing the sprinting, which really I, for the first couple of months, I was doing it almost every day. So I was probably overdoing it and really putting my body through the, the works for the past couple of months. And that could be the root of everything I'm talking about that I've been facing lately. But I went and got out and got, got my sprints done today. Before I started, I barely even wanted to stretch and get out there. When I was doing my high knees, I wasn't doing them as fast as I did at the beginning. Uh, when I would usually do them, I was like, gosh, I can barely even get my legs up. But by the time I got a little warmed up and my high knees were starting to get normal again, I got my jumping jacks out of the way. And then I started sprinting. And that felt great. I got a 60 meter, 180 meter, 120 meter. And then I repeated those one more time, 60, 80, 120 for a total of 720 meters of running today. I get back inside and I feel reinvigorated. I felt wonderful. Something that I just, I never, I never used to do. 
And if I had done that three years ago, I'd have been ready to die. I also noticed that over the past three months when I do these sprints, my heart rate used to get a lot higher when I would do a longer sprint. Like I would do a 180 meter sprint, I could easily hit 170 on my heart rate. Now I'm hitting the high 150s after doing 180 meters. I'm not even breaking over 160 anymore like I was just a couple weeks ago. So my heart rate is able to recover quicker even though I'm putting it through max effort for a long period of time. The, the 180 is the longest run I do. And I also noticed that when I would get done with a sprint, even a 60 meter sprint in the beginning, Boy, I was out of breath. I was like, oh my God, I can barely breathe at all. Now I could do a 180 and when I'm done, I f you know, I'm trying to catch my breath, but it isn't anything like it was before. I feel like I can catch up much quicker than I did when I started. So things just keep getting better and better. And I expect that as long as you're focused on getting your health in the right direction, yes, you may have some bumps in the road. You may have some difficulties you're going to face. It's life. We're not going to have everything perfect all the time. But the one thing I do know is I feel better this way. I feel healthier this way. And if it's going to take that for you to get in there and change the way you're eating and change your life for the better, maybe you have to go cold turkey the way I did. I don't know. I think it's going to have to be a decision everybody makes. And there's no sense in having somebody scare you out there about it. The thing she mentioned about kidney stones, I think that might have had to do with oxalates. And again, that's something that I didn't have any experience with. If you're pounding smoothies like crazy, that probably is a concern for you. And I would recommend you check out Sally K. Norton on that issue. Anyway, that's all I got for this one, guys. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope this information helps. And we'll see you for the next reaction video. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat? I love it just as much as I did before.